and do it such that uh, 8 billion people on this planet have access to real-time information about their own health anytime, anywhere, and any, any place in the world. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing and joining us today. So I had the pleasure of talking to each of these women before the panel to learn a little bit more about their backgrounds and their um, work specifically. And one of the things that I found most interesting is that all of you up here are driven by your passion, but also past experiences, which I think is crucial in really advancing a cause um, to have that passion and that personal experience behind it. So I was wondering if you could each touch on your past experiences that drove you into your desired fields. So I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, so for me, uh, my passion in starting our company was really brought about when I migrated here in the United States um, some 20 years ago. and. I remember being the eldest daughter carrying all the medical records, bags and bags of medical records of my family. And it's all handwritten notes. And, you know, my, thankfully my, my, my father is very OCD, you know, that he likes to keep everything in order and make sure that he has copies of everything. And uh, I just remember when I was looking for, like, what's the next big thing for me? I was working at J.P. Morgan Chase at that time and Thankfully, my cousin knew of my hunger for doing something very different from what I was doing. Um, and at that time, he was working on um, a platform with his co-founder, with his best friend from college, who was a medical doctor, a neurologist. He's now a regional movement disorder specialist at Kaiser Permanente. And they were looking at how they can manage medical records. Um, and that was like six years ago and still one of the biggest problems that we have here in the United States. Um, and they started pitching that idea of the company to me and I just remember that pain point of carrying all those medical records, being the eldest child, and I said there has to be a better way and uh, that's what made me join the company and really started looking at how can we bring that enabling technology of digitizing medical records in markets like my home country, the Philippines, uh, where I grew up, where it's still paper-based medical records, handwritten notes. Um, and that's what made me start the company with notes first. I, maybe, okay. <laughs> I think you already heard what my passion, what, what my impetus was for starting the nonprofit for brain health. I had already had another startup. I started a wine business 33 years ago. My husband and I bought a vineyard together, and then I have run the wine business and the vineyard business since then, except that now my daughter is our president. Um, and, but I, then I started my uh, nonprofit uh, 25 years ago, and that was because we found out 30 years ago, all of a sudden, our golden boy, our firstborn, our son, at the, after the end of his freshman year at Dartmouth, had an acute psychotic break. And we thought it was our fault. And we needed help ourselves to find out that it was a physical thing in the brain, that it wasn't our fault, that there's always a genetic predisposition, and there's then something that triggers it environmentally, whether it's stress at school, a girlfriend that broke up with him, both of those things happened. Um, he'd gone far, far away as the California boy at the East. Um, but we were able to get him help because we ran toward the problem, took his tragedy to triumph today. He's just doing beautifully. And he's married, owns a home, works full time, got his master's degree, did finish college on time and with honors. And, um, has had struggles throughout his life, but now he's doing well on medication, on love, on um, therapy, therapy once a month. And he also is very active and is structured every day. He does meditation and he also does brain exercises. Two of the things that we have found in our studies over the years through our researchers, early on, 20 years ago, we found, I, identifiable ways to figure out how a child is leading up to a psychotic break before they do have it and stop it. Uh, it's called a prodrome. It's the symptoms leading up. And I can go over that with you later. There's, you know, there's several steps, but it's things like uh, change in sleep behavior, uh, hearing voices, um, being suspicious of things happening around you and, and which are totally separate from reality. 
Um, but then there's other things that happen as well that can cause these, uh, these crossovers from sanity to psychosis. So luckily we found the prodrome. We have programs going throughout the state of New York. Uh, throughout the state of Ohio, throughout the state of California more and more now, and we're creating digital apps so that people can monitor themselves uh, when we identify young people at risk and have them pay attention to the signals that can show whether or not they might be heading toward a psychotic break or a depression. Um, and then we've also developed a patch you put on your arm. It's not in use yet, but it just was developed at UCLA, and it is, um, it, it, it will it will identify the molecules, the chemicals in your sweat, and it can communicate with your doctor to let your doctor know when you may be heading for a depressive episode or something like that. Just a couple of things that have been very, very well um, uh, developed. And one more is that digital monitoring and therapies have been used for 20 years. Um, I use Brain HQ. It's really good for memory. Um, it's good for schizophrenia, for bipolar disorder, for you name it, you can pick what you want it for, stress. So that's what I do, and I love doing it, and having the wine business is a great backup because we meet so many people, and if they can, if they can afford our wine, they probably have the capacity to support brain health research. <laughs> that was so great. So I worked in the biotech space, and um, by nature, I'm kind of curious. I'm always interested in wanting to know why did you go into the chosen, the chosen field that you're in? So what motivated you? And it's not a surprise that every practitioner wants to initially help people. They want to, you know, cure cancer. They want to change the world. But when you get out of medical school, you spend more time when you open up your practice running a small business, HR. Did the fax machine work? Did this happen? And so I found that really what most of the providers signed up to do is not necessarily what they were doing. At the same time, I had um, learned about a technology that we ended up acquiring that was developed at the National Institute of Health that would allow people to be able to measure, like I was saying, nutrients and supplement absorption. Well, if you look at medicine hundreds of thousands of years ago, Chinese practitioners were really, um, the whole goal of your doctor was to keep you healthy. That's actually how you were compensated, was making your patients stay healthy. When they were sick is when you would have a deduction in your pay. But our healthcare system has swung so far to the other side that those conversations that I was having were all around side effect profile, can we get something approved by insurance, really had nothing to do with a better outcome. Now. I personally believe that regret is a very dangerous thing. You do not feel it yet. And that is how our healthcare system is built, on regret. And so if there is a way that we would be able to help swing that pendulum over to the other side where we were preventing these things from happening, that we could do that. So it was a little bit by just being naive but one of my first uh, practitioners I worked with is a Mayo-trained oncologist. And he started a, the first integrative uh, med medical program in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I said, I, th I think we need to partner together. And that took one year of that conversation of walking him back and forth to this uh, tumor board. But the result of that is that they are now doing clinical trials with the state of California because they're able to see that when uh, your inflammation system in your body is lower, that there's less disease. And there's the ability to be able to have some regenerative components to that. And so that's probably been the most rewarding thing. I was actually sharing that with a practitioner this morning is that when they call and they say, you know, I just, I, I tested my patients and I, I put them on, uh, uh, we ended up partnering up with a company from the supplement um, side of that. And, and maybe I'll talk about that in a little bit, but I put them on your products and they're doing amazing. And what I mean by doing amazing, I mean by people getting off prescription medications. That's what I mean by doing amazing, that their quality of life is better. So we all know that, you know, we're now living to be, you know, many years older, but our quality of life is what we want to be able to sustain. So the question was, what's the story? <laughs> Just sort of, um, 
just I know many of you were motivated by passion. Yeah, is dead. Hello? Just that. What got you to do what Hello? you're doing? Okay. Yeah. Um, so my story uh, starts uh, from the age of three. I grew up in rural Mississippi in a small little town where black and white people lived on different sides of the railroad. And my parents had emigrated from India, and my dad was a town surgeon. And for about a 100-mile radius, he was the, the most... Oh. Hello? Okay. So uh, did you hear that, or should I say it again? Okay. So my story begins at the age of three in rural Mississippi, uh, where I grew up. Uh, black and white people were living on different sides of the railroad. And my parents and I moved there when I was three. Uh, and uh, they had immigrated from India. I was born in Massachusetts, and my dad was uh, the town surgeon. So for about a 100-mile radius in rural, in the depth of the rural south, my dad was the essentially the only health care that rural, that rural area was getting. And uh, he was highly overqualified surgeon uh, from Massachusetts who came there uh, essentially uh, to live the American dream and help uh, uh, these people who were basically without basic health care. And um, so he would take me to the operating room with him from the age of six. You can only do that in rural Mississippi. And, uh, and I got to see firsthand medicine, and by the time I was eight, uh, I would make rounds with him, and I thought I was already an MD. So by the time, <laughs> years later, when I went to Harvard Medical School and did my MD and PhD in physics, it was, it was old hat. I felt like I'd already been there and done that. But what was interesting uh, is I spent, uh, just like I was in many worlds in the deep south that didn't talk to each other, uh, I used to meditate a lot in nature because we had a lot of greens and chickens and peacocks and stuff. And that meditation exposure led me to believe that there's an underlying unified truth in nature and that underlying unified truth transcends whether it's physics or medicine or these different disciplines. And so years later, fast forward, uh, I'm going between, back and forth between the Charles River, between the physics department at Harvard, MIT, and Harvard Medical School, arguably one of the best in what they do, but they didn't talk to each other. And I felt like back in rural Mississippi, there are different communities that didn't talk to each other. And, uh, and what I realized is that there's an underlying unification in science, in technology, what we're doing with our businesses and industry, and the human endeavor. And so I started NanoBioSim with this vision that we can take a holistic integration of physics, nanotechnology, biomedicine, information communication technology, and at that convergence, we can create new science, new technologies, new spin-off companies, and new ways of solving the world's biggest challenges, starting with healthcare, energy, environment. So that's my big uh, thing I set out with. So I set up the NanoBioSim Research Institute and started working with DARPA and NASA and these agencies who were basically funding my science and research. And then a few years later, I spun out our first commercial company, which has developed this product that won the uh, X Prize and recently got its first FDA approval. And this is a, a representation of going from a centralized model of delivering healthcare where you go to a hospital or a centralized lab where you're basically, uh, uh, you know, the entire system, you revolve around the healthcare system. Many times you can go to a hospital and feel like, uh, uh, I hate to use this analogy, a bag of organs on an assembly line, the GI specialist, the cardio specialist, and so forth. But imagine a system where we shift uh, the patient from revolving around the system to the system revolving around the patient. So I, I see three big trends in healthcare and wellness care. One is going from a centralized to a decentralized model, which is what has happened in two industries, the information industry and the telecommunications industry. It has not yet happened in healthcare. And that's why I think that this $3 trillion crisis in the United States 
and the fact that four billion people on our planet don't have access to health care is going to change when we can decentralize access. The second revolution in health care that's upon us that we all have to work together is going from a, uh, a, a more blunt instruments to more precise instruments and going to a more personalized approach to healthcare. Each individual has their own set of parameters that affect their health and wellness. And doing this top down where you take the average of the everybody in this room and then you take all their parameters and then you run a clinical trial and then you look at the effect of let's say one therapeutic intervention on everybody it's confounded with too many variables so one of the things we want to do with the gene radar system is build these apps that personalize your markers like inflammation uh, we're starting with infectious diseases but we can go into oncology measure your real-time genomics and transcriptomics so you can see your own living information as it's evolving, as a function of everything you do in your environment. Uh, I like to say when we sent uh, with NASA last year and Elon Musk, we sent a project to the space station to see the effect of gravity on DNA. And I like to say that DNA is like a piano and the information in the environment plays the piano. And it's as you understand that interplay, it determines the music that an organism makes. And we all have our own music. And if we can understand and decode with very precise tools how your DNA is, but how the information in the environment is playing on your DNA, we can really bring that next generation. All right. That's great. Well, Apparently time flies when you're talking about biotech and health because we're out of time. Um, I apologize, but I really hope you gathered some information from these women's incredible stories. And please feel free to talk to them later. They will be at table 16 or just walking throughout the rest of the day. But thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of the panel. Thank you.